Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiara. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really hope that this session uh, gives you a little bit of a flavor of the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Crossroads is a fully funded development opportunity for students who are from low income backgrounds and are the first members of their family to attend college. Um, if you look in the chat, you can see all of the links for our program. Um, so please take a look just as we get started. And we're really excited to, um, to have you meet our co-founder and um, a current faculty at Harvard Business School, Darren Khanna. Um, Darren, over to you. Okay. Um, welcome everybody. It's nice to have uh, so many people. Um, this thing is gonna go out to several hundred, several thousands of you all over the world. We're very excited. Um, uh, let me just say, uh, say a word about what we want to accomplish this uh, in the next half an hour. Uh, I expect that this will go, uh, it's um, one minute past nine my time, maybe 30, 40 minutes or so, and then uh, Tiara will stick around to answer questions for a little bit. Um, but this um, is a program that was started uh, with a colleague and a lot of other friends, uh, colleague Kareem Lakhani, uh, who, like me, is a professor at Harvard. We've been teaching here, I've been teaching here. But Kareem's a lot younger and better looking than I am and smarter than I am, uh, but still there we have it. I'm, uh, I've been here 27, 30 years, and this is the most fun I've had with the program. But the idea here is really to find people that institutions like Harvard don't normally get to see, which is very, very smart, talented uh, young men and women uh, from all over the world, especially from the emerging markets, first in family to college, really important. That's the idea is to find what we like to call the lost Einsteins uh, in the world. They're really smart people everywhere. And very often it's hard to build bridges to um, uh, mentorship, educational opportunities, uh, ability to get things uh, running. So this is a completely a labor of love for uh, Kareem and me and literally now hundreds and hundreds, maybe even several hundreds of volunteers around the world. It's completely free and a lot of fun. So what, what we're gonna do is um, in the next 30 minutes is I'm gonna give you a flavor of a couple of uh, cool things uh, that I've been thinking about working on, um, engaging with uh, one from uh, Africa and one from Latin America. Uh, so by training, I should say I'm an applied mathematician uh, but I am also an entrepreneur and I start companies and nonprofits in different parts of the world, mostly developing countries, and uh, get to meet a lot of interesting people. So I'm going to pick two examples just because that's what I thought of this morning when I got up. I said, these two look really cool and let's talk about them. And I'm going to show you a couple of videos, which are public videos that are on YouTube, show you small little clips and then ask you a few questions about them. And this is what we do in Crossroads. Um, we have uh, dozens and dozens of faculty from mostly from Harvard, but also from other elite institutions around the world who are volunteering their time to lead discussions on things that they are really excited about or they are world experts in. And it, the idea is exposure because, you know, everything good that's happened to me in life comes, has come because I've been exposed to a number of interesting people. And that's really the name of the game here. So the idea is exposure. So I'll give you a little bit of a flavor of it uh, in, this, uh, in this setting. To do this, I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, with, a, with a small PowerPoint deck. Um, can you see that, Tiara? Is that visible? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, so, so, so here we go. So the first thing I'm going to share with you is this. <laughs> this, is a, this is a drone, right? It's a drone in Rwanda. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a drone run by Zipline. Those of you who are from Africa, we have a number of people from Africa um, on, the, uh, on the Zoom call and literally in our system, thousands and thousands of people from Africa. Uh, this is a, 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 a medical logistics, healthcare logistics drone company, Zipline, uh, started by one of our students here uh, at Harvard, Keller. And it's a company that exists in California and Rwanda and Ghana. Uh, and is trying to redefine healthcare logistics. The idea is that you can put um, uh, life-saving medication, think of blood samples and not blood samples, blood um, and vaccines and critical care medicines and stuff 
these days, uh, COVID masks um, and ship them to places that are impossible to get to otherwise without the drone, right? So that's the idea. So uh, my colleague Salman is going to show you, I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen and Salman is going to show you two short video clips. One is of a minute and then you'll bear with us and we'll show you another two, three minutes of another one. And then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about this and you can, the chat is live so you can type into it anything you want. Um, we do have a standard of community values at anything that we do, uh, which is all your comments have to be constructive um, um, and done in a spirit of intellectual inquiry. You're welcome to disagree, but they have to be super polite. Not being polite and respectful is a recipe to get kicked out. Uh, it's that simple. And that applies regardless of whether I'm speaking to heads of state, prime ministers of countries, CEOs, big shots, school kids, I don't care. Any misbehavior, you're out. Otherwise, you're most welcome to join us, okay? That's simple. Okay, someone uh, take it away. Uh, thank you. Zipline is divided into different teams. We have the flight ops who carry about pre-flighting plans, packing, loading the packages, and make sure that plane can fly. And then we have health ops. You can include more of the people with the knowledge of the blood product. We make order to Zipline by using SMS or by using uh, WhatsApp. The package is handed to flight ops. We scan the package and that's when we put the vehicle on the launcher. The vehicle will fly autonomously up to the hospital. <laughs> We can avoid expiries, we can avoid stock out because the supply chain has improved. Blood is life, it is saving life. No one does. Play the second one now. Zipline is an instant delivery network for healthcare products. And we use drone delivery at national scale to allow countries to provide universal access to healthcare to all of their citizens. In the long run, we're just a new kind of logistics network. Okay, so we have some video, and I want, to, I want you to walk us through what we're about to see here. But sure. uh, this is the drone takeoff process. Ex explain what's happening. Yeah, so uh, we operate from, a from our own distribution centers and the vehicle will basically launch from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in about half of a second. And once it's in the air, it's flying fully autonomously out to one of the many hospitals or health centers that we serve throughout the country. Okay, so you also have the access to pleasure in the air. It's now going to fly. It's flying autonomously, right? Yeah, yeah. It and when the vehicle arrives at the hospital or delivery site, we'll actually deliver the package from about 30 feet up in the air and we can deliver into what our customer's quote unquote mailbox, which is the size of about two parking spaces on the ground. So it's super, super accurate. And then this is the video of the drone recovery process because it actually has to get back to base somehow. You have to land. Right. And what, this yeah. is. So there's no landing gear on these aircraft. I mean, we, we build everything from scratch. Uh, it really hasn't existed in the world before. And we're catching a one centimeter target on the back of the aircraft. This is the advantage of using highly precise flight algorithms rather than pilots to fly planes. What happens when it's windy? I mean, interestingly, you know, it's not enough for us to say that we can save patients' lives when the weather is bad. We have to be able to operate all the time. So we fly in crazy storms, day in, day out, rain, wind, um, everything. And finally, Zipline is expanding its delivery radius in Rwanda. Explain that. Yeah, the, so the way, that we, the way that we serve countries is we'll build distribution centers to cover every human uh, in the country. And so you can see basically operating from two distribution centers, by the end of this year, we're gonna make, we're gonna, in partnership with Rwanda, make Rwanda the first right. country in the world to have universal access to what's, healthcare. What's the cost per delivery? Is, is it, do, do, you, do you break that down? Well, that depends on which country and the price okay. of labor in each country, but generally it's less expensive than doing a similar delivery right. using a motorcycle. And in terms of healthcare products, is there a certain weight limit in terms of what you can actually send on, the, send on a drone like this? Today we're delivering around two kilograms per flight, but we, you know each distribution center can do over 500 flights a day. Right. So you're, you're delivering thousands of kilograms of right. medicine to hospitals and health. Now the Rwanda government has has obviously given you a path to do this. The U.S. is a lot more complicated. Do you see this coming here soon? So 
a lot of people assume that rural health care is only a challenge in developing countries, but that's actually not the case. You know, uh, critical access hospitals in the U.S. are closing at a record rate, right. and the U.S. has the highest rate. Of okay, um, so you get the flavor. Uh, so these are all these the, the things I'm showing you today are all public. So what would happen in Crossroads is um, uh, we would not use these materials. We would use our proprietary materials that we've developed at Harvard and send it to you. But that's difficult to do uh, at this uh, at this point. So let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, Okay. So here's my question. Um, and and the, the floor is open, so you can raise your virtual hand, right, in Zoom. I'm sure most of you know how to do that now with, uh, with the, in this pandemic world. Um, or you can um, uh, type in the chat and uh, one of our team who's on the call will, will call on you. Okay, so, so here's the question. What do you, you know, with this admittedly very short introduction to Zipline, I mean, this is an ambitious play, right? To say we want to be the healthcare logistics company of the future for the world in some ways, potentially, right? Starting in the operations that you saw are all in Rwanda, which is where the company started. Uh, and the videos you saw are about a year and a half old. Um, uh, so but what, what do you think is the core of Zipline? What do you think is the most important problem that they've cracked? Anybody? How about we hear from uh, Franklin? Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so from my own perspective, I think the core of uh, Zipline is to increase access, universal access um, of uh, medicines and healthcare um, products to um, I guess, demographics and uh, people in rural demographics, I guess, and to ensure um, universal access to health. And okay, um, so it's about, it's about access, right? And how do they do that? Oh, okay. So, um, so they do that by ensuring that they have um, an end-to-end uh, process in terms of logistics from um, the healthcare providers to the people who need the produce. So that would be from uh, the blood banks to the hospitals or to the healthcare centers, I guess. So, so the idea is that we don't have to go, you know, uh, uh, we have some people from Rwanda on the call, and I see a whole bunch of faces from East Africa. Um, you know, this particular terrain is quite, is quite hilly and rocky and so on and so forth. Um, and it takes a long time to take a motorbike and go from one place to another. And imagine um, you're a physician or a community health worker and you need to get blood for somebody who's critically ill. It's going to take you a long time to send a bike to Kigali or something like that. So getting the drone showing up in a few minutes is obviously life-saving, right? So the idea is that uh, under access, communities that are hard to access, uh, wow, this could be literally a life-changing event. Somebody else, anyone else, Kiara? Let's hear from Nadine Yanka, um, Faith. I, if I said your name right, please correct me. Okay, yeah, your voice is very faint, yeah, but go ahead. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think the core, the core of Zipline is to save life, no matter what the cause be, because I believe that it was the difficulties of getting to save life that brought out the, the drone that could, that could send medications to those uh, inactive or inaccessible places. Okay, so, so, so the aim of the company, right? So, so we should distinguish between two things. What's the aim and the mission of the company? Um, and as was just said by this, by this young lady, is, it's to save lives at the end of the day, right? uh, to improve access to life-saving medications and medical interventions and so on. That's different from how we're going to do it, right? So what's the core of the method that has been developed uh, that would be very difficult for somebody else to come in and say, hey, I can do that too. So good comment, but what's, so keep, keep in mind the distinction between the mission of the company and how we're going to pull it off. Anyone else? Let's see a couple more. 
Let's hear from Jam. Are you able to speak? And you can type into chat in parallel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Jam from Pakistan. And I uh, think that the core of the zip line is to, first of all, to save lives. And second of all, to reach those areas that are unreachable in the under, underdeveloped countries at the very lower and uh, you know the cheaper cost and make as fast as uh, you can reach those areas okay okay thank you uh so one more so in the chat uh uh shema has said to transport medical supplies cheaply and govind in the chat has said cost reduction Okay, so let's go. Let's go with uh, Sema. Sema, that sounds like a Turkish name. Um, uh, how how are we going to transport this cheaply? How, how does it become cheap? Where is the cost saving coming from? Which is related to Govin's point also. Um, can I speak? Yes. Uh, I don't know who I is, but yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm Marianne from Mexico, and I think that okay. they need kind of more technology to get the medicines okay. time. Okay, so what kind of technology is this? Well, obviously you saw the robot, uh, the drone, the flying, uh, what, but what else? Yeah, um, I think that it could, well, they could make like some mechanism for the drums to go faster and take the okay. medicine. Okay, so there's two kinds of technologies going on here, right? Very broadly, there's the hardware that you saw and a lot of the secret source in here is in the algorithms, right? in the artificial intelligence and the data crunching. So imagine that a, you know, that a drone, by the way, a drone is about, let's see, I'm about just shy of six feet tall. The drone is maybe eight feet, eight feet long from on wingspan, um, about 50 pounds, you know, say give or take 20 kilos. Um, and uh, can, hold, can, can take about a two kilogram weight, five pound weight per, per flight, but it can do, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of flights a day. So you can transport thousands of kilograms of medical supplies in a day if you need to, but each flight can do that small amount, right? But every time the, the, drone, the drone, they call it the zip, the zip goes, right? There are so many sensors on it that are capturing everything, capturing thousands of items of data second by second by second as the flight goes. This is autonomous unmanned flight, right? Plus they, they're gathering data on the nature of demand patterns, you know, who in what hospital system, initially in Rwanda, but now in a bunch of other countries, who is asking for what time of day, how does it relate to wind and, and rain and all this other kind of stuff. There's so much data. So you need very sophisticated algorithms to process the data. And it's the interplay between the, tech, the technology is represented in the hardware, which is the cool looking stuff that's flying, and the softer technology, which I think is even more crucial, uh, which is the 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 machine learning, the AI algorithms that are powering this, that allow you to optimize delivery and reduce cost over time, which makes it easier to deliver this, right? Okay, let's take one more, uh, one more comment and then I'm gonna ask you a different question. Shoshana, do you wanna chime in? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, another advantage that I think that um, the zip line can have is the network, because in the short video, they mentioned that they, before starting the operations, they are creating this network in the country and in the city, and which targets covering especially areas which are not accessible uh, to healthcare. So that network will be hardly copyable for another one coming. So software and hardware, engineering advantages are of course um, hardly copyable, but also the network because creating the network itself uh, is a hard thing and time consuming thing to do for the business, for other somebody else coming. And okay. another advantage, uh, if I may continue, yeah, uh, ahead, would, be, yeah. uh, would be that uh, it is, uh, can be cost efficient uh, to fly some certain kind of items to the hospitals in remote areas compared to building roads and uh, stuff to make them uh, accessible for by car or by any other uh, land uh, means of transportation. 
Thank Great. You. Okay. So, so very important, two, three different, actually multiple points made in that comment, right? One is that um, once you build out this network and you have relationships with healthcare providers and, and, and so on, then for somebody else to break into that, into that space and to compete with you becomes really difficult, right? Unless they have a completely new uh, set of uh, uh, innovations to do that. So that's one observation. And the second that I thought you might be getting at also is this idea of uh, what, what, what in economics sometimes we call network externalities, right? The idea that I can serve hospital A better because I also know what's going on in hospital B and C. And why is that? Because I'm gathering data from A, B, and C, and my ability to serve any one of them is enhanced by the fact that I have this overall network, which if you think about it is an amazing thing because the name of the game is gathering data and doing things with it. Okay, great comments, great comments. Uh, now, of course, in the actual Crossroads program, we would spend a lot of time going into detail into this, just as I do in my, uh, in my Harvard classroom. So let me go to another. So here's my question. The question is, what will Zipline be when it grows up, right? And there are four options here. So the status quo is in the upper left that you can see, which is it's basically a health logistics company. And you heard Keller, the CEO, uh, briefly describing it like that. And it's basically in developing countries, right? Um, uh, Rwanda, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, trying to go into India now, trying to go into Israel. Israel is a middle-income country, uh, but essentially it's in this box in the upper left. And Keller and his team have to think, what are we gonna do with this? We wanna, we, we wanna be true to a mission, but what is our mission gonna be? How do we imagine our future? And this is the key. A lot of what this program's about is to encourage you to reimagine the world. Uh, both Keller and the other example I'm going to show you are people who started with nothing except an education and reimagined the world the way they saw it. There's really nothing that's going on here that you can't do. Nothing. And I mean it. Um, so here, here are the options. Should Zipline in the future, so you have to choose one. It's a multiple choice thing. You have to choose one very quickly in, in 20 seconds. Do you stay with healthcare but go into all developing countries? Um, do you go to health, stay with healthcare, but go to all countries, including rich ones, richer ones? I don't know, pick one, Swiss Alps, America, anything. Or do you stay in developing countries, but do all logistics, what they call blood to burritos, right? Or blood to sandwiches or whatever you want to call it, whatever you eat in your, in your part of the world. Or lastly, do you everything for everybody? So pick one, real quick, let's go, chop, chop. Uh, Chair, I cannot see any poll results, so. I'll just uh, read them out, if that's okay. We'll give five more seconds for students to answer. Okay, 10 more seconds, and then Chair will read out the polls. Can you publish them on screen? No, or you can read them out. Uh, yes, it'll publish them. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Please vote quickly. Calling it now. Okay, so you see the results. Uh, everybody can see them, I think, right? Um, most people want Zipline, a uh, little less than half of you want Zipline to be, stay, stay in healthcare, don't start doing other stuff, um, uh, but go to all countries, right? So that's good. Um, could you be on mute, please, if you're not speaking? I don't know if that's music or uh, somebody's <laughs> somebody's conversing. Okay, um, so the, the the bulk of the sentiment here is to essentially remain in healthcare logistics, remain in life saving mode in some sense, but find an economically rational way to do it, uh, but do it in all countries. So as it turns out, um, Keller and his team just announced a part partnership with Walmart, big company in this uh, in, in in this part of the world, many parts of the world, to distribute uh, essentially COVID supplies. Okay, uh, here's another request. Do you mind going on mute, please, whoever it is who's entertaining us with their music? Thank you. Um, so we would spend some time discussing this in, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the Crossroads, as well as maybe have Keller join us in the Crossroads program on video, et cetera. So you get a flavor of that. But the key I want, you, I want to emphasize is about imagination, about coming up with a new solution, about um, having the... Um, 
the confidence and the guts to try it, right? And that's what I want to encourage all of you to do. Uh, that's my that's my and my colleagues' role as educators uh, and as participants in this process. And just to be clear, I am very happy to try things like this myself. I started many of these around the world, and most of them fail. Every so often, something works, and you have to be comfortable with that uh, with that craziness. Uh, Okay, let's go to uh, um, another example, right? Totally different example. Here's the question. So this is from Venezuela. Completely different part of the world, right? Latin America. Uh, I don't see that many uh, um, Latin Americans on this, on this, uh, on this but I'm, I'm guessing from the name, so I could be wrong. Uh, but in any case, can music save the world? Uh, this is a colleague of mine at Harvard, Yo-Yo Ma, very famous uh, cellist. Uh, and this is a picture from uh, uh, our uh, local newspaper um, where uh, uh, in, the, in the middle of the COVID uh, pandemic, Yo-Yo Ma decided that he was going to, I don't know, do like a 15 country tour with his cello as a way of using music to bring the community together, right? It's a crazy guy, super creative. Uh, I would say even a genius, musical genius. Um, and he started doing it. But the question I'm posing is, can music save the world? Right. And really the themes I wanna encourage you to, to, to think about are it's the same thing. It's imagining the unimaginable, thinking aggressively about the future and positioning yourself so that you can participate in its creation and have a fabulous uh, professional and personal life doing that. That's my aspiration for all of you. Um, uh, Saman, can we play that little video? I'll stop sharing it. Just a short video on uh, El Sistema from Venezuela. Last year at the proms, here in the Royal Albert Hall, something amazing happened. A huge orchestra of kids from the shanty towns of Venezuela came to play Shostakovich's 10th symphony. One critic called it the performance of the season so far. It was an astonishing proms debut for one of the most remarkable orchestras in the world. I would say in my experience that there is no more important work being done in music now than is being done in Venezuela. The second half of the concert went off like a rocket. The promise had never seen anything like it. But that's only half the story. The Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra is the product of an extraordinary musical revolution that started 33 years ago and is credited with transforming the lives of an entire generation. How Venezuela used classical music to save lives and why Scotland is now trying to do the same is the story of tonight's Imagine. Venezuela's an unlikely setting for a musical revolution. Despite having some of the largest oil reserves in the world, 60% of its population lives in poverty. Since 1975, an ambitious scheme known simply as El Sistema, the system, has been taking children from all over the country and putting instruments in their hands. But it's not just about music. It's unashamed social engineering keeping kids off the streets and away from drugs and gangs. The orchestra's conductor, Gustavo Dudamel, came up through the system himself. At the age of 27, he's acclaimed as one of the most exciting conductors in the world. Next year, he becomes music director of the LA Philharmonic, but his heart's still with the orchestra he grew up with. For a conductor, the dream is to have an orchestra. I'm living a dream.
you are listening to the Simon Bolivar Orchestra. It's a big soul, you know? When I'm conducting, I feel a big soul there. It's something like... And you see the faces and the eyes, and the smile. To live, they need music. And when they are playing, they are giving all their energy like it's the last time or the first time. Wow. Among the 270,000 children being taught by the Sistema a nine-year-old Oriana and her big sister, Noelia. The Sistema has had a big effect on me. It's helped me grow as a person, as a violinist and as a musician, to be better in the future. My mum and dad are happy. They come to my concerts and tell me that I'm doing well. I'm not sure that I'll keep playing the violin, because when I grow up, I want to be an actress. The man who started El Sistema 33 years ago is Jose Antonio Abreu, and he's still in charge today. Abreu began with just 11 youngsters rehearsing in an underground car park. Now 15,000 teachers train over a quarter of a million children. What made you start the Sistema in 1975? I realized that one of the most efficient ways to fight poverty was to introduce excluded children and young people to a musical education, give them a way into music. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the question, so as you saw in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the video, um, First of all, the video is old, it's 12 years old. Um, the numbers they said, you know, 250,000 kids in Venezuela in the poorest parts of Venezuela. Venezuela has gone through so much uh, trouble uh, in the last decade. Uh, those numbers are more like uh, a million students being taught as we speak uh, in shanty towns by, um, by thousands of music teachers who are all volunteer teachers who have all themselves been taught in the El Sistema school. Right, it's now in 55, 60 countries. And what I mean by that is different people have said, including New York City, including Boston. Like Boston has a world famous uh, music conservatory and they've got a lab inside it that essentially learns from El Sistema, which came out of the slums of Mexico. And you saw the gentleman, unfortunately he just passed away, Jose Antonio Abreu uh, at the end, who you know, was basically, and I think he was an economist or a lawyer and he was interested in music and he said, this is the key to reduce poverty in my country. Why did he say that? And the chat is going crazy. Uh, <laughs> so anybody, who's a uh, chair, you want to call someone? How can music reduce poverty? Which is what uh, Abreu was after. Fernando, do you want to? Um... May I go, sir? Yes, yes. Um, hi, I'm Fernando from Mexico. I think that uh, the music can offer uh, another alternative of uh, activities and rather than drugs. Also, um, music uh, can be um, create a career of musician, musician in their people. Alternative to poor ways to spend time, like drugs. So you're a young kid, you got nothing to do, you're in a poor place, you have no relatively less role models, you could imagine that you fall under bad influences. And what Abreu is saying, hey, listen, what you have to do is commit to giving me a couple hours every day after school. And you come to this little garage, which has almost no equipment in it. By the way, many of the instruments are homemade. 
because nobody has the money to get the instruments. So homemade instruments in the beginning. Um, there's some amazing examples of what people have been able to do. Okay, somebody else. Thank you, Fernando. Somebody else. May I speak? Um, I'm going to call on folks who have their hands raised in the chat. Yeah, raise your hand if you want to speak, and then Tiara will try to call on you. Remember, there's hundreds of people on the call, so please be patient here. Go ahead. Mariana, um, let's hear from you. Okay, well, I think, like, music gets you really, what well, makes you passionate and that like you can change the world with the passion and I think that's like for me is the mm, principal reason well yeah that's all so so Mariana is this different from playing sports I mean you know sports also unlocks energy sports also takes us away from uh spending time in unproductive ways right it well, builds teamwork so is this different from sports why not I think he's saying it's the same but different, you know, because sports is everything like more rough and well, like that. And music is well delicate, but at the same time, no. Okay. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it can like I don't know. I'm nervous. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't be nervous. There's uh, there's no wrong answer. So by the way, if it helps you, when I teach to you know, senators and congressmen in America, or heads of state, they, they talk the same as you. It's no different. Uh, Hello. We're all human beings. Yeah, so go ahead and say whatever you want, as long as it's polite. Hello. Um... Okay. Hello, Sorry, Professor. Second. Can I speak? No, one second. Tiara's going to call on you. Go ahead, Tiara. Yes. Um, thank you, Mariana. That was great. Uh, how about we hear from Hamid? Hamid, yeah, go ahead. Hamid, can you hear us? Uh, sorry, ma'am. My name is Abid. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Go ahead, Abid. Yes. Yeah, I'm calling in from Bihar. And uh, if we have an opportunity to use music to reduce the poverty, we can choose change the whole industry in the music in India, especially. The music is a terms for the rich portion. Especially here, uh, what I look, only uh, rich person is learning the music, but if you choose this tool for the dedicate the poverty, we can change the whole scenario, especially in my state. Okay, Abed, thank you. So it's Abed from Bihar in India. Um, right, so he's observing that there's no reason that it would be nice if music could be accessible to the poorest person, the most disadvantaged, which is exactly what, what uh, uh, Jose Antonio did in Venezuela. Right? He went to the poorest people and said, come and participate in music. I know you don't think of particularly Western classical music as normal for you, right? Um, and you know, one of the questions I have about this is why does it have to be Western classical music? Why not Venezuelan music? Why not local music in Spanish uh, or in Portuguese or any other language? Um, and uh, I, you know, so I don't have a good answer to that. Um, and in fact, El Sistema does do a lot of stuff in local languages now. But this is how they started, because I think this is what Ebru liked as a person and nothing wrong with that. And he used it to ignite. So his, his thinking was that, look, if people can use music, right, and we can use homegrown instruments, it's not expensive. They get them off the street. They imagine beautiful things with music as opposed to uh, have negative thoughts. They learn the discipline of spending a couple hours every day practicing this. They learn the discipline of daily practice. Uh, you know, my children grew up playing classical piano in my house. Um, and one of the best things about it is that it gave them discipline. You had to do it every day, every day for hours and hours and got better over time. And they had a sense of accomplishment as a result of it. That's what he's trying to cultivate. He's not trying to make them musicians. He's just trying to cultivate a sense of personal commitment, resilience, um, hard work, a sense of accomplishment. And he's saying that is what will change the world. Okay, so, so this is, so I just wanted to give you these two examples and I picked them because honestly this morning, um, I was Hello. thinking, what's a nice way to communicate this to you? Sorry and for I thought, interrupt. Let's say, uh, could, could, I, could uh, I just finish? Could you please mute yourself? We cannot speak over each other. I'm so sorry, but there's too many people on the call. You can type in the chat in the meantime, if you wish, right? So I picked two very different examples. I picked drones and robots and technology in Africa and classical music in Venezuela, uh, both have the prospect of changing the world. 
And I think it's just exciting to be able to imagine that. Uh, and the only thing connecting them really is uh, creativity, uh, some degree of imagination about the future, desire to have an effect and willingness to work hard. Okay, so let me stop with that, but just to give you a little bit of a flavor, and I think we are, Tara, am I doing uh, uh, a quick overview of Crossroads? Sure, yes, that'd be great. Okay, so, so let me just say a few things about Crossroads. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset, that this is uh, a, a, um, a not-for-profit charity program that my colleague Kareem Lakhani and I with some friends in Dubai, Gulama Marsi and others uh, started uh, four years ago. And the idea is to uh, find so-called lost Einsteins, very talented people who are first in family to college. That's the proxy that we use in, uh, in any country in the world. We started with uh, eight countries in the, in the Indian Ocean Rim, East Africa, Middle East, um, uh, South Asia, um, and uh, in the first year, the second year, we were in 25 or 30 countries. Last year, we reached 115 countries. This year, we're expanding aggressively into Americas and Southeast Asia. So I imagine the cohort will keep growing. And what is nice is it brings very talented people together from other talented people around the world, mostly using technology. Um, we used to have a physical convening in Dubai, which we hope we'll be able to resume once COVID passes. Uh, but that purely is a function of when it becomes safe to fully travel in the world. So we'll see when that happens. But last year we did it as a fully virtual program. But let me say a word about uh, what, what, we, what we hope to do in this. So the stage one is to identify uh, who you are, right? To get you to apply. And the initial application, I think the last date is March 20, is it 22nd, Tara? 22nd? Yes, our applications are due on March 22nd. Yeah, so after March 22nd, we will take no applications, uh, but it's a 15 to 20 minute initial application. Um, and the, the, I think the, the, uh, the URL is in the chat or Tara will put it up again. And I'll put it up again at the end of this, uh, this, this webinar. Stage two is to uh, continue with the application process, but do it through free access to a lot of Harvard X courses, which are these online courses, uh, so-called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, uh, that you can choose from a menu of courses. And the idea is to see basically how committed are you to the process and to take the time to do it. So it takes time, it takes a few, a few weeks to get through it um, and to do a formal assessment as a, at the end of which you will get um, uh, a pretty detailed feedback form um, on you know, where you score well and where you don't and how you benchmark with other uh, people in your peer group around the world, right? I actually think that the assessment itself uh, is worth, uh, worth the time, uh, if nothing else, uh, not, not, not only just the access to other things. And in stage three, we will, in, and this is how we're evolving the program this year, uh, offer literally dozens of internship opportunities, which may end up being virtual, so again, depends on COVID, uh, may end up being physical, that are typically in your region, right? To avoid all the visa problems that we have around the world these days, we will also basically ask those of you who make it to that stage uh, to submit, if you're interested, a proposal to do something that you're really excited about uh, in your own geography that can have huge impact. Uh, and we'll offer prizes of up to 10,000 US dollars uh, for some of the best ones in there. And lastly, we will include you, if you make it to that stage in a vibrant alumni community, uh, from around the world. And you've seen on this call, we've seen people from Africa, we've seen people from Latin America, Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So this is a global community and increasingly being shaped as such. Okay, how do I go to the next slide here? You can see, uh, 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 so at the bottom left is uh, Kareem and myself. We started this as faculty. Uh, we were joined by uh, uh, two colleagues, Kristen Fabi, uh, who is a political scientist who spends all her time in the Arab world, right? Is currently living in Greece, and is a close friend of ours. She works with a lot of the refugee communities uh, out of the different conflicts in uh, the MENA region, uh, Middle East, North Africa, um, and uh, Caroline Elkins, who does all her work in, uh, in Kenya and East Africa, uh, and is a historian by training. So the four of us then uh, brought it up to year two, 
And then last year we were joined by 15 or 20 colleagues who are senior faculty across Harvard, MIT, uh, Boston University, local places, basically all telling you about their passion. And the passion could range from um, uh, decolonization uh, of, of processes and political mobilization in different countries. It could be about machine learning and artificial intelligence. It could be about one of my friends calls digital phenotyping. In other words, to look at how you engage with technology and categorize you into one of different kinds of uh, individuals as a way to understanding how to serve you better with algorithms. Um, it could be about political changes unfolding in China as we speak. It could be about vaccine delivery. So the entire spectrum of human knowledge in some sense. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to put any restrictions. We're not trying to get you to go do A or B or C. We're trying to get you to find your passion, imagine like crazy, and go out and do something cool. I am so excited. Uh, to be able to do this uh, with all of you. Um, and here finally is our website um, uh, where you can apply. So again, the initial application is 15 to 20 minutes. I encourage you to consider it. It is a good use of time, completely free and welcome to the community. So I will stop sharing. Uh, Jared, can I stop sharing and hand back to you? Jared, can I stop sharing? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I will leave you in Tiara's excellent hands. Thank you for joining us. So nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tiara is going to stay on and answer questions. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I will be staying Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much. See you soon. Hi, can you hear me? Just checking. Um, yes, I can. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. Great. Okay, so let's all try to keep ourselves on mute again. Um, I will hear you. online to answer questions about Crossroads, and our team is here to support you with anything you might need for your application. I know we had a couple of questions coming in the chat. Um, if you have a question about um, how to do something or a specific stage of the program, we're happy to welcome all questions. Um, so let's take a little, uh, maybe two minute break. I'm sure questions will come in soon, but I just wanted to follow up on um, the piece about music that Tharn was talking about. I think it would be really cool if everyone could send their uh, favorite song right now in the chat so we can see what kinds of songs students are listening to from all over the world. Um, just send the name of your song, who it's by. Maybe all of you will get some new music recommendations. Um, and then I will start to do questions. If possible. Um, if you have a question, our team will unmute you. Um, so, um, Marianne, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question, but I think in the chat has been answered. As it was about, yeah, also resubmitting the application. Great, yes, so that's a great question. Let me start with how you submit your application. So our applications are due on March 22nd, and the first application takes 15 to 20 minutes to complete. Um, and we really encourage you to just go ahead and submit that. Um, once you submit that application, our team will get back to you in the next two weeks on the status of your application. And then we will invite you to take five free Harvard X courses, given that you are a uh, student who is the first of a member of the first generation of their family to attend university or, uh, and also comes from a low income background. If you have questions on what first generation college, first in family to college means, um, I can clarify I know it means different things in different places. So thank you for your question, Marianne. Hello, Jara, I want to ask a question. So I think it would, I know we have um, about 200 people on this meeting. It would be really great if, uh, if um, you raise your hand and then we can call on you. Yes, um, I Jara, think Jara, I want to ask a question. My name is Benjamin. That's, um, I will call on students through the chat. I just wanna make sure everyone's question gets uh, answered if that's okay. Um, I also wanna encourage you all to keep connecting with each other. 
I know that uh, JB has just sent a WhatsApp group. Please feel free to join that. Please feel free to connect with each other on LinkedIn. Um, you can send your LinkedIn's. I'm seeing a lot of really cool song recommendations in the chat. Um, I will definitely be listening to some of these later. So, so keep sending um, and I'll keep answering questions. Hello, you, Tira. Yusuf, do you want to ask your question? Mm -hmm. Sorry yes. to interrupt you. You can call. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Um, are you listening? Yes. Uh, you hello. OK. Um, good afternoon, Tiara. I'm Yusuf from Nigeria, and um, our temperature here is 29 degrees Celsius. So um, my question is, um, on the previous meeting, you said about the, you talk about the, the courses, the Harvard X courses that we'll be doing, we'll be doing three courses. So I'm wondering if um, we ask to choose one course and then do it, or one can be doing two or three courses all together at a time. That's a great question. That's my question. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Yusuf. So we will provide five free Harvard X courses. And I'll tell you the course names. Um, and you can see we have a wide uh, range of disciplines. So we have a course in um, entrepreneurship and emerging economies. We have a course in launching breakthrough technologies. We have a course in digital humanities, which looks at how we can use digital tools to answer historical questions. We have a course on uh, strengthening community health worker programs. And we have a last, our last course is on probability. So if you're quantitative, quantitatively minded, there are courses for you. If you're interested in humanities, if you're interested in public health, there's courses for you. You can take all five courses, um, but you can only earn a certificate in one course. Um, but the certificate you can use on your resume, you can submit to your university, you can um, use a certificate uh, to, to show future employers. Um, so you can use a certificate in a lot of ways. Um, but again, you can take all five courses and earn a certificate in one of the courses. I hope that, that answered your question, Yusuf. Uh, uh, hi, uh, I just want to uh, ask something. Uh, uh, if uh, you are you had you had participated before in the previous year and you have uh, taken those courses already, uh, can we uh, take some other courses? Because uh, in the last year I have taken all the five courses and completed all the five courses, and uh, uh, it would be better if I just repeat those. But uh, what are the scenario for those people who are already? I have learned from these those courses. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. It's exciting that you've been involved with the program for two years. Um, my recommendation, so we only have those five courses, um, so you can take them again, but we can't provide you a certificate in any other courses. Um, we can provide you access to audit other courses on edX, but those are the five crossroads courses. I also just want to repeat, we will call on students who raise their hands. Um, please don't just speak up because we want to make sure we get to hear from everyone. Um, great, so let's go to um, Zubair. Do you have a question? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we hope you are fine and healthy. Uh, this is Zubair Mubarak from Afghanistan. And uh, the uh, question I have in my mind is that uh, how much uh, individuals will be uh, allowed to, or how much uh, individuals do you have planned to uh, get success for, uh, for uh, this program? Uh, if you could let me know. And also uh, yeah, how much will it be the length of uh, the program? Uh, that would be your most thanks. Thank you, Zubair, that's a great question. Um, so the way Crossroads work is that, works is that at every stage of the application process, um, you receive some kind of benefit. And our goal is, is really to distribute as many educational resources and opportunities to as many students as possible. Um, and so I don't think uh, only finalists and semi-finalists receive benefits. Even at this stage, you're all meeting each other and interacting with each other meeting our faculty already. So, so again, you receive some kind of benefit at every stage. Um, we select about 300 to 500 semi-finalists. And from there, we select about 100 finalists for the program. 
Um, but before then, all it's it's a very democratic process. As long as you complete a Harvard X course, you have access to the skills assessment. As long as you do the skills assessment, you have access to all of our sessions with Harvard faculty members. Um, and then I just want to reiterate that we know that that you are all coming from low income backgrounds. I know many of you are, are really busy and many of you are tired. And so I just want to emphasize that you really can be successful in this program, even if you don't expect it based on your grades, based on whatever you've already done. Um, you don't need to have a certain GPA. You don't need to have already interned or worked at a big company. Um, we really run this program so we can identify students who have not had opportunity. So students who are hidden Einsteins, um, the hidden Ramona Johns of the world, who may not have had the opportunity to really showcase their passions in school. Um, and we really want to unlock the leadership potential among these students. So uh, you don't need perfect grades. You don't already need to have an extensive resume or cover letter. We're not looking for that. We just wanna to get to know you as a person and support you at every stage of the application process as best we can. I hope that answers your question. If you also chat your questions, uh, a member of our team can uh, answer your questions in the chat. Um, I know there are also a lot of questions about what it means to be a first generation college student or a first in family to college student. So what that means is that we um, seek to address in Crossroads the generational attainment gap. So we know that if students' parents have gone to college and they have a college degree, they're much more likely to succeed uh, in their education themselves. So we seek to support students whose parents have not attended university. Um, so if your parents um, have a, uh, an undergraduate degree from an institution, you are not eligible for the program. But if your cousins have gone to school, if your siblings have attended university, you are still eligible. The criteria refers to your parents and your grandparents. I hope that is clearer. So. I know we have questions like if, you're, if your parent attended two years of college but didn't graduate, you're still eligible. If your parent has a master's degree, you are not eligible. Um, and again, we also do emphasize that we, the program most benefits low income students. And um, part of the Crossroads program is providing uh, cross-cultural opportunities to students who have not had the opportunity to travel and interact with students um, from different cultural backgrounds. And so we do have a travel uh, uh, requirement, which is that students who will benefit most from the program have not traveled before. So that is one of our application criteria. If you have had to travel uh, beyond your home country for reasons of political instability or completely unavoidable um, reasons, then we can, uh, uh, you can write to us through the submittable platform on your application and, and um, we can connect your question to the, the information in your application. I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to answer more questions, but I just wanna give you a heads up if you have a question specific to your application, it is most effective to write to us through the submittable platform. Um, and I will take another question. Um, please wait for to call on you. Um, Mateus, do you want to, do you have a question? Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Matthias from Rwanda. Yeah, I just have a question. Oh, like I'm on I'm I'm an online student. I study from University of People. Like I didn't get a chance to enroll at university in my country. So I would like to ask, like, am I eligible? Like, will I get in? So that's a really great question. Question. So unfortunately, the program is open to current undergraduates and um, recent graduates. So you must either be enrolled. In yeah, I said I'm studying online to University of People. Like I study online to University of People in, yeah, it's online. That's, I, I have a question. Will I be a regular? Like you said, the students should be like studying in his or in like in their home country, but I'm taking online degree. So will I be a regular? Yes, I understand. Um, again, like I said, the best way, if it's a question specific to your situation, please write to us through the submittable platform so we can have a sense when we determine uh, the status of your application. Um, that's really important. We really wanna connect your question to your application information. Um, 
I will take another question now. Um, Julia, did you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, my question is very specific, so maybe it's better to use the submittable platform, but I'll try it anyway. Um, I have traveled beyond my country, but it's like five hours away and it's like the same culture, even uh, it's for academic purposes. The university uh, sent me, so I don't know if I'm eligible still. Yeah, again, Julia, thank you for asking, but please, if it's a, if it's a question specific okay. to your situation, write to us through the submittable platform because we want to be able to give you the best answer that we can. Um, I hope that makes sense. Case by case. Okay, thank you. Thank also, you. if you're messaging questions directly to me on uh, the Zoom chat, I, I cannot type an answer right now. So please message them um, to Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program in the Zoom chat. Um, instead of me privately, because I want your question to be answered. Um, Agnes, do you want to ask a question? Okay, uh, Agnes, maybe we'll come back to you. Um, let's go to Nadine. Do you want to ask your question? Hello. Everyone. Hi, is this Nadim? Great. Yes, this is Nadim uh, Baraki from Lebanon. I'm uh, happy to be part of this meeting. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it's not that specific. Uh, maybe others have this uh, same question as well. Uh, so basically, I've already submitted my application a month ago. Uh, I have some changes in uh, the CV. Shall I edit the application or submit another one? Um, please don't submit another application. That's a really good question. Um, Nadim, thank you for asking that. Um, you thank don't you. need thank to you update your application materials at this time. Um, so if you have another accomplishment or anything, don't worry. Um, you don't need to send us those updates. It's okay. The last version you sent was fine. At this stage, um, the reason we have the resume, optional resume and optional link uh, and the LinkedIn requirement is because um, that's something that will benefit you in the long term is having a LinkedIn account. Um, it helps you connect with the Crossroads community. Um, it also helps you, you can show that to future employers. That's why we have it. It's not so much that we need to see every detail on your resume or CV. So Nadim, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, and basically uh, my LinkedIn profile is uh, much more updated than my C uh, CV. That's why I'm asking. Okay, oh, that, that's great. Um, as long as we have your LinkedIn, uh, you should be good. Um, I know someone okay. is asking in the chat when you'll have access to the courses. When you receive your acceptance letter, you will um, receive information on how to access the courses. Um, I'll take just go through the chat quickly um, to see if there's any questions. Um, someone, are you eligible? Hello attended a uh, model UN overseas. Um, no, that that kind of cross-cultural opportunity um, does disqualify you from being eligible for the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Okay, I will. So let's try to wait um, for our team to, to call uh, on you because we really wanna make sure we can answer as many students questions as possible. Um, Chaitali, do you want Hello. to? Um, ask your question. Uh, hello, hello, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Ma'am, if our parents are graduate, are we eligible for this? Could you? If our parents are a graduate, are we eligible for this, for this program? Um, if your parents have undergraduate degrees from a university. If, if, no, if, sorry, if they are graduates. From high school? Uh, yeah, from college. So if they have like a bachelor's degree, um, you are not eligible for this opportunity. But if they graduated from high school, um, then you are. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, hello, Tiara, may I ask you a question? Um, I'm Aki yes. from Bangladesh. 
try to make sure that that we're um, waiting to be uh, called on by the team just because we want to make sure everyone can ask the question. But go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have applied for the Crossroad Emerging Leader Program, but uh, while uh, filling up the application form, I was uh, found a problem. I found a problem. Like uh, in the first glance, when I opened the application form, there was a section which used to judge your intelligence level, something like that. So uh, after that, I saved a draft, but uh, didn't uh, complete my rest of the part, like personal details and CV attachments. But when I uh, opened it a uh, second time, then I didn't find uh, that intelligence uh, judging portion, the question set. Like there are supposed to be 10 to 12 questions. So uh, is it something that you have changed or like uh, I'm the only one facing this problem? The version of the application form that you are seeing is the most updated form. So please don't worry about the application. There's no error on the application. Whatever you're seeing on your screen is the most updated version. Um, I know that, that we have many, many questions lined up. Um, you can always reach our team at celpglobal at gmail.com with any questions, and you will probably get a much better, much clearer answer there. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I will take about three more questions. And then um, I know that for some students, they're joining from Cambodia, from the Philippines, it's very late, even in India, Pakistan, it's getting very late for you, Bangladesh. Um, so I wanna make sure that, that um, we're being mindful of everyone's time. So I'll take three more questions. And um, if you need to uh, ask another question, all of our social media, all of our email addresses are in the chat. You can please message us on there. Please tag us on social media. Um, uh, we're, we are excited to hear from you and ask uh, and, and, and get to know you. Um, but our time is limited today. Um, how about we hear from Mohammed Farouk? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So I have two questions. The first one is, is there going to be a formal kind of a test in the stage two of the application? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes. Yeah, so there is an online assessment that is uh, the, a part of the third stage of the application process. Um, it is not a standardized test. So we don't use that test to analyze how much information you know. It, the test is more oriented towards um, understanding your thinking skills and your thinking approaches and your problem solving strategy. And we do do some assessment of um, English language proficiency. Um, so I okay. hope that and, about the, the yeah, thank online you. assessment. I do want to, before you all log off, I do want to say, um, being fluent in English is not a prerequisite for success in this program. You can be really successful in this program without being completely fluent in English. Um, for 99% of our students, English is their second language, third language, even their fifth language. Um, and I think it's actually a really amazing experience to hear students um, communicate across so many different language barriers. Um, and also we cultivate an environment that encourages you to make mistakes. So I think it's also a really great English learning opportunity um, for students. So again, uh, you do not have to be fluent in English to succeed in this program. Um, I will, um, Agnes, I called on you earlier. Um, I think you're back now, so we can hear from you. Madam, please, I wanted to ask, um, hello. Yes, is, is that Agnes? We can hear you. Okay, maybe Agnes, his internet had to uh, cut off again. Um, Eric is asking for information about today's Hello. recording. And session is recording live streams. Um, uh, we can share the live stream link in the chat and you have access to the recording. Um, Agnes, yes. Agnes, yes. Hello, Madam. Please, I said I wanted to ask: How are we going to bring our uh, online course with the new or uh, our undergraduate course? How are we going to bring them together? Sometimes we will be in class before this online program will come. So it's it's like the the two courses crashes. So how are we going to do it? 
And second I, is... Agnes, so the courses on Harvard X are entirely self-paced. So you can do them on the weekends. If you have a couple hours of the weekend, you can spend time on it. Um, if you have a couple hours after school one day, you can spend time on it. But there's no specific time that you need to be on the course. I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you. A lot of questions about uh, if applicants from last year can apply again. Yes, if you applied to the program last year, you are eligible to apply again. Thank you for asking. Thank you for clarifying me. Really look forward to seeing you in some of our sessions again, hopefully. Um, and then just want to circle back to the question about uh, uh, the virtual program. So unfortunately, it would be our greatest, it would, nothing would be more exciting for me than to bring you all together in Dubai. Um, and we really are hoping that that will be possible soon. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that will be feasible um, with COVID-19 in the next few months. So for this cycle, we will not be convening in person, but we do hope as soon as it's safe for everyone around the world to have in-region alumni events. So um, that's something you can go to that will be in your home country or neighboring country. And then also we do hope to see our finalists in person at some point, but it will not be in the next few months. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, I know that there are many questions about students on scholarships. Um, if you are on a scholarship, you are still eligible for the program. That just uh, gives some uh, sense uh, to us who our students are and, and what their backgrounds are. So thank you, Irene, for that question. You are still eligible if you're on a scholarship. Um, just looking through the chat for any final questions. <clears throat> um, so someone asked why are students um, who have postgraduate degrees um, are not eligible? So again, the program, if you currently are enrolled in a master's program um, or a PhD program, you're not eligible for the program. The reason we do this is because cultivating community is very important to us. And our students are aged 18 to 26 um, and, and having an undergraduate community of emerging leaders um, is really helpful. It's also that we seek to uh, provide opportunity to students who, who don't have any opportunities. And if you are already enrolled in a master's program, you may have had some of the opportunities that other uh, members of the cohort may not have. So thank you, Srinivas, for that question. That's why we do that. Anthony, thank you for your question um, about how, uh, when you will hear back on, your, uh, on the status of your application, you will hear back within the next two weeks. Um, so thank you for the question. All right, so I know that was a, a big speed round. I know there are many questions that we did not get to. Um, I am, uh, our team is here to support you in any way that you need, but I just wanna loop back. Um, so you heard from Tharun Khanna, uh, uh, who's the co-founder of Crossroads and um, uh, uh, a faculty at Harvard Business School today. Um, that was just a little taste of what the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program does. We'll have events like this. Um, uh, we have an, another event like this coming up on Monday uh, with Harvard Business School professor Kristen Fabe and um, the CEO of Affectiva, which is an emotional uh, and artificial intelligence uh, organization, um, Rana El Kalyubi. We will be hearing from them on Monday. Um, we will send out those details to all of you over email. Um, we are really excited to get to know you through your applications. Um, it only takes 15 minutes. And also we have an unlimited amount of opportunity to share with students. So please let your friends know who are also from low income backgrounds, who are also for the first members of their family to attend university. This really is about creating a movement of young people, democratizing opportunity um, and empowering you to accomplish all that you can do alongside a global community of young leaders. Thank you so much for joining um, from every corner of the world. I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. I hope you're all connecting with each other. You shared your LinkedIn's. I know there's a WhatsApp group. Um, I hope you're having a lot of fun in those. Uh, and it's such a pleasure to see all of your faces. I can't wait to see them more, uh, maybe at our event on Monday, maybe at our finalist program in July. Um, I'm excited to continue to get to know you all. I'll stay on if there's any more questions that need to come in over the chat. Um, just for one or two more minutes.
Um, great, thank you so much. Um, we will be